uh, school board candidates um, uh, candidates forum, excuse me, sponsored by the LEA. My name is Patrick Keefe, and I am president of the Litchfield Education Association. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce the two candidates this evening for the Litchford, Litchfield School Board. Uh, first off, to my uh, left, uh, Jeffrey Larson. Good evening, Jeffrey. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you. And uh, to my right, Peter Plansky. Peter, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you both, by the way, for agreeing to participate in this. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's important to have a, a dialogue. Um, about education um, in this district in general, and um, certainly for the uh, for the uh, school board uh, seat uh, that is uh, going to be voted on next week. So, uh, thank you both this evening for, for coming. All right. So, first question this evening, uh, Jeff. I'll start with you if you don't mind. Um, what in your background leads you to believe that you would be an effective school board member? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, one of the, you know, the primary, the primary thing in my background um, is I, I have a background in, in education. Um, I spent uh, a few years working as a substitute teacher uh, when I still lived in California. Um, I was, uh, I taught at, you know, substitute taught at um, a, a charter school. So can, you know, kids who were, you know, for one reason or another, not, no longer in the nor their normal public schools. Um, and use grades nine through 12, uh, every subject you can imagine. Um, also taught ESL um, while in California and spent a few years working um, in uh, overseas in South Korea. I was a history and geography teacher out there. Oh, wow. um, so I've been through you know quite a bit educationally um, on the professional side. Um, and then you know myself, I consider myself to be a lifelong learner. Um, you know, I'm constantly looking for new things to learn and improve and, and, you know, continue to master as I progress through life, whether it be professionally, personally. Um, and, you know, it's that love of learning that I have that, you know, I feel can really, you know, be a benefit to the school district. Um, and as a direct result of that, you know, not only the kids, students, but, you know, teachers, parents, and community as a whole. Good. Thank you, Jeffrey. How, um, how did you like teaching in Japan? Did you enjoy it? Um, it was South Korea. Oh, South um, Korea. Yeah, South, yeah, no, it was, um, it, was a, it was good. It was a very, very um, unique experience. Um, I would say, you know, the, the one thing, you know, that I, I did get a very kind of deep look into and um, got to see was what happens when, you know, money budgets are not managed properly. Um, you know, what the school I was at, ultimately, all of the uh, native U.S. teachers ended up having to leave because they could no longer pay. Um, and, you know, that obviously impacted the, you know, the kids, um, the school, the community that was built there tremendously. Um, and seeing that, you know, it was pretty heartbreaking. Um, you know, so never want to never want to have to see that and, you know, would like to think that I'd be able to have a hand in preventing things like that from ever happening. Yeah, awesome, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Peter, the same question for you. What in your background leads you to believe that you would be an effective school board member? Uh, well, as a person who's been in business for a long time, I've worked with a number of different teams. I'm very good at bringing different groups of people together. And right now in Litchfield, we've got some frustration between the school board, the SAU, the teachers, the town. Um, you know, the taxpayers. So I think I'm able to kind of bring those groups together um, to do what is best for the overall school district. Um, I don't have an ed educational background like Jeff does, but I do have management background. And I think um, right now we do a lot of um, activity from on high. The, the, it's pushed down on people as opposed to gathering feedback from the people on the front lines, the teachers, the parents, the students, what they think is going to work best because you get too high in an organization, you don't know what's happening in the trenches. So you need to be willing to take advice from folks on the front line. Good, yeah. So, so um, yeah, it sounds like you, you would want to sort of bridge those, those uh, different um, sections of, of the uh, school community. Um, yeah, even, in, even within the town government, you know, there's been certain frustration from the school board to the selectmen, the selectmen to the budget committee, the budget committee to the school board. Yeah. And we, we need all three of those boards to kind of work harmoniously. Um, there's going to be disputes, right? Everybody wants 
going to push what they want to have. Yeah. But we've got to do it within and be fiscally responsible. Yep. So. Very good. Thank you, Peter. All right. Let's see. Next question. Um, Peter, I'll start with you this time, and then we'll sure. go to Jeffrey if that's okay. Sure. Uh, next question is, can you give us two educational priorities uh, that you wish to accomplish during your time in office? Um, well, I haven't been that deeply involved in the school in a long time, so I, honestly, I would ask the people, the stakeholders, what they think the educational priorities are. What do are the, are the teachers see? What do the parents see? What do the parents want? Um, I have my own concerns about the whole competency grading and homework and what works and doesn't work. And as a person who's in the business sector, what I'm seeing now is kids who have gone through this, they come to work and they have no idea how to meet a deadline. They don't believe, you know, it's foreign to them that a project is due on a certain day. Uh, and when you get into the real world, whether that's going on to college, college professors give you till midnight the day it's due, and if it's not there, <laughs> you know, you're, you're out of luck. Um, and, and same in the real world, whether you're a plumber or a, uh, somebody who's selling something or, or anything else, if it's due by a certain day, you need to hit it. And um, I think we're doing a disservice to our students by not having that be part of the program. Interesting. Um, so it's part of the college and career ready, um, having deadlines and, and holding, uh, holding students accountable to those deadlines well, I don't to think kids prepare are, are them. ready for the real world when they get out of high school. And, you know, Litchfield has always had a thing to try to get as many kids as possible to go to college. Yeah. College is not for everybody. Yeah, no. Um, the return on investment for college right now is not what it was even 15 or 20 years ago. Right. Um, kids are graduating high school with thousands and thousands of dollars worth of debt. Um, and with a philosophy do degree or a sociology degree, you're never, you're never going to be able to pay it back. You are preaching to the choir. I have a daughter who's a <laughs> sophomore, a junior in college. You have two daughters in college, junior and sophomore. The junior is a sociology major. And I keep thinking, like, boy, she's racking up some debt. <laughs> so, yeah, it's preaching to the choir there, Peter. Sure. Thank you. Did, is, yeah, I'm good. good. Oh, great. Okay. Awesome. Um, thank you. Okay, Jeff, same question. Can you give us two educational priorities that you wish to accomplish during your time in office? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, you know, one of the larger ones I have, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, I envision, you know, being able to provide the space, the resources, the environment um, to these students um, that is conducive to successful learning, um, successful progression, but, you know, through, through each grade um, and ultimately getting to that level of preparedness where they're able to take that next step um, and, you know, have, you know, have that, that license within themselves to be able to make the, the, the decision, hey, I want to go on to college, I want to go straight into work, I want to take a year off. Um, you know, thinking back on my, my personal experience, I was drilled in, you've got to go to, you got to do well in high school, you have to do well, because that way you can go to college, otherwise you're never going to um, succeed. And I mean, you know, someone with an MBA who still, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, it's great. It's done a lot for me, um, but it's not the end all be all going through all that education. I think being able to, um, you know, really equip uh, students, young children, uh, with the tools that they need to be able to make those decisions for themselves um, is one of the most important things that can be done and working to start paving the way for that. Um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, um, even within three years, you know, we can get a foundation going, um, but it's something that's that definitely, it's a long-term uh, scope there. Um, and the other is, you know, I, I feel like, you know, opening up more dialogue, um, getting more more involvement across the board with, you know, you've got students, parents, the board, you know, the town, you've got all these different places. Um, and oftentimes, you know, things kind of become siloed and there's not an, a lot of, you know, direct communication necessarily. Um, we live in the age of, you know, everything is digital um, and a lot gets lost in translation in that. Um, and so I think really working to, you know, build that cohesiveness between all of them um, will go a long way in, you know, establishing a, a healthier and, you know, more robust educational community in Litchfield. Very good. It sounds like um, both of you want uh, collaboration uh, in the district and, um, and all the different, um, all the different uh, players to sort of work together 
and, and create a uh, successful school district. Mm -hmm. So that's good. You mentioned also um, uh, student empowerment. Is that, you know, sort yeah. of getting them to sort of uh, be individual sort of um, learners that, um, uh, that are, you know, meeting deadlines, as Peter said, and just sort of being accountable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, and being, you know, being, you know, in the workforce, I'm, you know, in manage managerial level, um, working in a bank and, you know, seeing, you know, folks coming in who, you know, they're in their thirties and, you know, it's just all, you know, seeing, you know, all they're able to do is just follow direction, you know, do this and it, you know, can't take one step si outside of the, out of the box. Otherwise, you know, the world's ending and, um, you know, there are you know, absolutely circumstances where needing to operate that way is important. Um, but, we, I, you know, in this world that we live in now, that idea of collaboration um, and, you know, feeling empowered, being able to make decisions um, is something that is important and I think is going to continue to be more and more important as we get more involved with technology and automation. Um, it's, you know, not going to have somebody sitting but next to you telling you what to do all the time so mm -hmm. interesting you know you guys I think both of you kind of talked a little bit about collaboration and um, and perseverance you know being able to persevere in in, in, uh, in challenging conditions because that's what life is you know mm -hmm. it's just it's there's always challenging conditions you know and meeting those challenges um, and uh, you know I think you guys are, are right on I think there there needs to be collaboration so that everyone's on the same page and working together, and uh, and we need to foster independence and and um, and uh, perseverance for sure. You know, definitely perseverance. All right, thank you both for your answers. Next question: um, Who did I start with last time? I'll start with Jeff this time. I believe this. Yeah, I think so. I think I start with Peter last time. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, what do you believe are the most important characteristics of an effective school board and of an uh, an effective school board member? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most important characteristics, um, you know, I think, you know, one being, you know, tuned in and, you know, being, you know, as, for the school board being tuned in, um, knowing, you know, what is going on, what is at stake, um, you know, what is the, what is the decision that's being made tonight going to mean tomorrow, next week, a year from now, um, you know, being able to really, you know, kind of look behind the curtain a little bit and, and understand the long term ramifications of things. Um, being able to, you know, approach, I think approach things from a holistic point of view, um, you know, in, in any line of business, you know, they're, they're, everything's got those little ugly parts, right, that we don't like, whether it has to do with money or a facility or, or what have you, and focusing on like one thing that, you know, uh, we don't like this, if we don't like how it looks or it costs too much money never going to get anything done and so it's you know being able to come together as a board um, uh, realize what that long-term goal and vision is <clears throat> excuse me and start working at it one step at a time um, you know kind of idea you know progress not perfection sort of thing um, and as an individual member I mean you know I think um, you know from you know as I, I kind of just think about myself um, you know having a you know a, a child under the age of one who's going to be, you know, in a few few short years going into school, um, you know, trying to think about what would I want when going into school? Um, and, you know, what would, you know, what would my parents have done, um, you know, to, to make sure that I had great educational opportunities, I had a conducive, you know, pleasant environment to be learning in, um, you know, how, you know, how can I contribute to the overall betterment and progress of the district, of the individual schools, members of the board, members of the community. Very nice. That, that you know, we always talk about America. One of the charges of being an American, I think, is for us to leave the next generation in a better state than we're in. You know, so um, glad to hear that. Thank you, Peter. Same question. What do you believe are the most important characteristics of an effective school board and an effective school board member? Well, I think you have to be engaged, really, kind of fully engaged. I, and I think it's um, having watched the school board for the last couple of years in particular, um, I don't think it's an easy job. I don't expect it to be an easy job. I think one of the things I can help do is kind of bring back a sense of trust and, try to, and transparency from, from the board to the public, not just the parents in the schools, but also the overall public. I don't think they communicate real well. 
I think when you go to some of these meetings, everything seems to be a little bit shaded. You get kind of three quarters of the story. Um, you know, we had this situation a couple, two years, yeah, last year or the year before, where the LMS thing went way over. Mm -hmm. You know, a million, million and a half dollars lost, or not lost, but kind of misspent. Um, so, I think you need people who understand the financial piece. And in my role, in my job, I have responsibility for budgeting, staffing, uh, you know, and running a business to a profit. Now, we can't love to be able to run the school to a profit, but it's a public institution, and we've got to work within what we have. And what I'm starting to find is that there is there's just the way things, some of this money moves around is a little bit confusing and, and you, it's very hard to draw that information out. Um, so I, I think because I have that kind of background, I'm gonna be able to help identify where there's money um, that was either left unused and used for something else or earmarked for this program, didn't get used and it got pushed over here. Um, and there's real, really no trail as to what happens with these unused funds mm. or the fund balance. So I'd like to try to square that away, and I think if we get our financial house in order, we'll be able to do a lot more for, for our teachers our, and our kids uh, and produce a better outcome for everybody. Sure, have a uh, more sustained uh, economic uh, situation in the district. And um, I think trust, like you said, Peter, is an important part of that. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, and transparency, I think you, you spoke about too. So uh, that's good to hear. Good to hear. Thank you, Peter. Sure. All right. Um, we'll go back to Peter and then Jeff next. So uh, you guys both kind of talked about this a little bit, okay? But if you could just kind of share with us your uh, vision of um, education in Litchfield. Um, well, I think the, the people of Litchfield, those who have kids in school and those who don't have kids in school, want the kids to get the best education that we can provide. Um, the last part of that sentence is that we can provide. You know, mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of business in Litchfield. Um, all of our school budget comes out of property tax. Litchfield is only so big. It, you know, We're not a town that has got a lot of cash coming in other than property tax. Um, you know, Right now, the enrollment is dropping. Um, so we need to be wiser with our with our dollars. Um, you know, I think I don't know. There, I think the, we need to get the kids out of GMS. Um, but how we do that is sort of the next big hurdle. Is it build a new GMS? Is it look at what can we do with the two existing buildings um, mm -hmm. and, and get everybody in it? Given the enrollment projections are dropping, and I think by 2026 it's going to be around a thousand kids in all in pre K through 12. And that's with development coming. So I think we need to be more open to looking at what, what is sustainable. And I don't know that sustainable means three buildings. You know, we just, we're putting a ton of money into LMS, right? It'll probably be $10 million when we're done. New GMS is $35 million plus interest. Um, are we going to be sitting here in five years or 10 years with three half full buildings? So, you know, there are thoughts out there and, um, of consolidation. I don't, don't know where I stand on that just yet, but it's something that's got to be looked at. Mm -hmm. I think it would help the high school kids tremendously, where you could have eighth graders taking languages, um, sec, you know, even maybe add a second language um, to the program. So I, I think you've got to be engaged and be able to think outside the box. I think we've been sort of myopic, or the board has been sort of myopic, as this is what we need to do, and they've been driving to that goal without really considering seriously any other options. Yeah, yeah. Peter, um, can I ask you, so when you say consolidation, just for clarification, mm -hmm. are you talking about, so like, because I've heard this rumor too, possibly like six through eight at the high school with the, or? No, I think or, it would be uh, pre-K through six, through six at LMS. Okay. And then um, seven, through seven and eight. Now, when Campbell was built, it was built with a design to put a wing on it. Yeah. You know, that wing might cost 5 or $10 million to do, and you could s separate the 7th and 8th graders, um, much like they did at the middle school with the 5th grade kids. They had their own area. Um, it's just a matter, sort of a matter of the numbers, and it would be, it'd be a hell of a lot cheaper if we had to put a wing on CHS and even a wing on LMS and not spend... 50 million bucks for, for, for a new GMS or a reimagined GMS. Um, so I think we need to be to revisit 
all of that before we throw down 35 million bucks. Yep. And so, but you're pretty, you're, you, you agree that GMS is kind of, you, we need to move on soon from I GMS. I think we need to that... get the kids out of GMS. Okay. I, I, I yeah. was able to take a tour there a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, it was old when my kids went there. Yeah. Um, I'd love to save the old building, honestly. And, um, huh. you know, it's got some issues there too. I'd love to be able to save that. I don't know what we would do with the rest of it. I, you know, if I could make, wave a wand today, I'd put the SAU in the old building. I think it would be really cool. We could free up the space the SAU takes up in the high school, create more classrooms. Like those were originally supposed to be special ed classrooms. I think there's room there to, um, I think we could make it work if people will, would try to get to yes. Very good. Thank you, Peter. And Jeff, same question for you. What is your vision for the edu for education in Litchfield? Yeah. Um, you know, what... Thought about it quite a quite a lot, um, you know, and I think, you know, the, the, there's so much, so much conversation, you know, you know, obviously around around GMS and what do we what happens there, is it new? Is it consolidation? What have you? Um, it's very very clear to me that there is a lot of um, you know love and sentiment sentimentality surrounding that, um, and you know my and my vision is you know. Is for sure moving forward. I think you know moving on from GMS, um, but doing so in a way that reinvigorates you know that that love of education and the schools. Um, you know, putting that spark in in the community. Um, you know, students, the teachers, you know, parents. You know, people who are looking at having you know their kids start. People who have had kids in and are no longer there. Um, but, you know, have that new. The, that new thing, um, you know, readily, just readily there and people wanting to be there, people wanting to be involved with it, um, you know, not split, you know, every which way over what is happening next and where the money is spent, um, you know, coming together on that united front and, you know, just being excited about it. Um, I think that would be, you know, a, a big win. Um, you know, I think especially, you know, the, you know, kids are, are, so impressionable um, and you know to be able to get that energy from their from their their teachers their parents you know anybody they're interacting with I think would go a long way um, in, in just continuing to grow that uh, that desire for education um, you know and, and I think in turn would you know help maintain you know enrollment levels think you know things like that like you know looking at and looking at you know the the state of GMS you know, talking with, you know, some of the other folks that are involved and, in, you know, what's going on with enrollment people, you know, we're going to go elsewhere because we don't want our kids to go there. Um, let's make education in Litchfield a place that people want to send their kids. Um, you know, I don't want to go and, you know, over to Hudson or, you know, wherever it might be. We want to actually, we want to come to Litchfield. Um, that, that's, you know, what, where I'm at with it. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. And, and so actually I'd like yeah. to ask both of you this. So, Article two, of course, the Litchfield uh, voters get to um, cast their uh, votes next Tuesday. Um, five articles in the school district. Article two is about the land acquisition for a potential GMS. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys want to speak to that specifically? You kind of touched upon it, um, both of you, a little bit. But did, do, would you care to speak to that a little bit more? I think it's a great. I think it's a great place right across the street from here. If yeah. we we're going to do a new school, I don't think you could create have a better spot. Yeah. Um, the concern is it's it's a pretty good sized parcel of land. Um, the I think it's thirty nine or thirty five acres. Yeah. Um, right now, what I saw was it's eight and a half acres buildable. Um, at the del deliberative, they said it was ten. Um, there's some wetland. It's all wetland. You know, half. You know, the big quarter of it is wet, very wet. Yeah. And the, this the southern end, right, southern end, is all very hilly and it's sort of unus, unus, unusable. Yeah. Um, I think it's tight. I think the state said it needed to be 10 acres. Um, so oh, is that were, right? So it just kind of qualifies? Yeah, that? which I think no. was why they disqualified doing it over at LMS because there wasn't enough buildable land. It had to be 10 acres. So I'd be concerned if there's really 10 acres there. Um, it would be great if we had a center of town. There is no center of Litchfield, right? This, we have the fire station, now the police station across the way. If there was a school there, it would be great. Um, I think the town, I think we should buy the land um, and then see what happens with the new school. 
in the interim, we continue to look at all of our options. And if that falls through, you know, maybe conservation can pick it up, maybe the town can pick it up, um, rather than, because it's really not buildable. Like I say, there's eight acres over there, and so you might stick in four houses over there, maybe. Yeah. So. And isn't the deal anyway, they can, they can return, they have up to uh, how many years they can they return the land to, to buy. Their, they have two years, two years to, to buy, buy the buy land. Them. So yeah. this year um, and then next year. Yeah. What was odd is in the, in the Warren article, it gave it, it, they gave that a five-year spread. Yeah. Um, which we, I found odd. I, I mean, I read the purchase and sale agreement. Um, you know, I think that a school goes there and it's going to be named after Mrs. Riley's daughter. I think that's fantastic. Um, but it, what bothered me is it didn't tie it. It didn't tie. The Warren article doesn't tie to the purchase and sale agreement. So at some point, they would have to go back to the, the landowner and renegotiate. And at that point, the landowner can say, well, now I want a million dollars. Well, now I don't want to sell it, you know. So um, Mrs. Riley is uh, older than me even. So um, we'll... We'll see, but I think if we were going to do a new school, I think that would be a great place for it. I just don't know that we necessarily have to have a brand new school. If we can, I'd like to look at all the options. Very good, thank you, Peter. Sure, Jeff. Same same question put to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm right there with Peter. Um, I, I think I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I, I think yeah, absolutely, would be great to have have a new school. I mean, the mock-ups, you know, all that look beautiful looks amazing um, but how feasible is it I think that you know more more due diligence needs to be done um, you know more along you know more research needs to be done to ensure yeah this is something that is going to pan out and not you know hey it's a great offer let's just jump on it and you know hope for the best um, you know I, I think it, it needs to be done in a way that would um, you know be a benefit and you know be able to you know, even if it, you know, if it's borderline, you know, the walk away, it's not the right time. Um, you know, I think in, in making a decision um, to, you know, acquire new land, start a new build um, is no small one. And I don't feel like that's something where you can have any kind of doubt in your mind. I think especially, especially here in Litchfield, you know, uh, you know, it's been said multiple times, not a huge town. Um, you know, there, there's, a lot at stake and you know I think much more so than places that are you know significantly larger have you know m more tax dollars coming in more revenue um, it's just not you know wouldn't be wise um, so I, I think making sure it is absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt the best move then great let's go for it if not let's hold off and you know assess what the alternatives are um, and I think that kind of caveat of assessing the alternatives, making sure it's not like we are still exploring alternatives and actively moving towards, um, you know, what that next step would look like, not just walk away and say, okay, we're done. We're just going to make the best of what we got. Um, I think we continue to do that while looking for what that next step is. Okay, thank you. And so on the same kind of, uh, on the articles, the Warren articles, Article 1, of course, uh, voters will have the decision to uh, either pass the operating budget or we go to default budget. As you guys know, the discrepancy is huge between the two. It's, you know, eight, $800,000. Um, what, what is your feeling on the operating versus uh, the default budget? And Jeff, I'll start with you, then go to Peter. It's okay with you guys. Um, yeah, so I mean, I you know I think that the you know the operating budget I mean, is is the way to go. Um, you know, I understand it means you know it's going to come out of my pocket, come out of you know everybody's pocket more, um, and you know like that can be you know difficult to swallow. Um, but you know, coming back to kind of something I touched on earlier, um, you know, the people that are a part of the educational community, the teachers, the administrators, the staff, you know, it, it, those people are the, the core and the foundation of education. And, you know, from where I, what, what I've understood and what I've seen, um, you know, is going to default means getting rid of, um, you know, not just programming, um, you know, whether, you know, it's sports, different, you know, elective courses, um, but that also means staff. 
and it's the people who are, are you know, pouring their hearts into it um, that are going to get the short end of that stick, unfortunately. Um, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I see it as an investment in our, our education's future and in Litchfield and the teachers, everybody that is there, it, it's there for them. You know, it's not, you know, it's not about buying the land or, um, you know, improving and, you know, overspending. It's, I think really in my mind, in my heart, what I, what I see it as is it's, let's invest in the people who are making the day for these kids on, on throughout the school year. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Peter, same question to you. What's your feeling on the operating budget versus the default budget? Uh, in my very informal polling, um, I would say, honestly, the, the operating budget's going to be a tough sell. Um, it's a lot of money. The prior year's default budget, I, wanna, I think it's about $700,000 above um, last year's budget, the default is. So it's already a big number. Um, there is also money... When I got some numbers to this afternoon. You know, we have a lot of, every year there's a lot of fund balance. And over the last few years, that fund balance, which could have been saved for a rainy day to, to continue to hire teachers, um, or just as really as a, as a piggy bank, they poured that money into other projects, mostly the capital reserve, capital fund, right, to, to do LMS. So was, That's Article 3. Um, That's Article 3. Nope. The, in the past, for instance, last year there was $800,000 in, in, in fund balance. At the end of the school year, after all the bills were paid, yep. they were sitting on eight hundred grand. They, put, they gave $300,000 back to the taxpayer. They used 500000 of that to pay down the part of the $1.5 million error. The other million they took from our maintenance funds and... Um, improvement funds, I forget the, the exact names, but it was around uh, 980000 bucks to get back to that even. Because that phase, LMS phase one was so poorly managed. Um, there was, you know, they, saying it was an error, somebody should have known that you can't carry a, a, a deficit forward on a construction project. So that has left a hugely bad taste in the mouths of many in town. You know, um, now, in this budget, the, in, the, in the operating budget, there's $470,000 that's sitting in there that is still paying off part of the LMS project. So, to my mind, does that mean it was really not a $1.5 million error, but a $2 million error? So, until we get the um, financial house in order, um, I think it's going to be a tough, tough sell to the public. But if you go, even go back a few years, I mean, the first year of COVID, there was a fund balance of over a million dollars left over at the end of the year. Now, 700000 of that went back to the taxpayers. They put some money in some other funds. And I haven't had a chance to go, and I, and I just got these numbers today. Um, but every year, there seems to be money left over. Even this year, um, Mr. Totten uh, informed me that he doesn't know what the fund balance is going to be, but he believes there's going to be a fund balance. So he said, check back with him in April. Now, um, Warren, uh, I think the last two Warren articles are to take some of that money. And yeah, three and any, four. Yeah. Yep. So, but there's uh, three, four, and five. Five, right? all three of them, yeah. It's like 350000 bucks, 125 for, for this account, 125 yeah, for that account. Yeah, yeah. And then another one for benefits, yep. right? For teacher benefits, right. changes Article and five. things like that. And yeah. uh, I have another, there's, there's weird, uh, sort of weird accounting with that too. Um, but there are opportunities. You know, we may find out that we have. Four hundred thousand dollars left. So that you know, I don't want to lose teachers. Nobody wants to lose teachers or staff. Um, unfortunately, you know, eighty percent of the pay, eighty percent of the budget is payroll, um, or you know, payroll and benefits. Yep. Um, so, so what do you cut? You know, do we take the four hundred and seventy thousand dollars? And this is, I think, is a viable option, unless you're a, a, a cook at LMS. But the four hundred seventy thousand dollars is to finish the kitchen at LMS. Now the kitchen at LMS is old, right? It's not the it's not the most wonderful place, but if it were me, I would say take that four hundred seventy thousand bucks and use it for teachers, and 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 hold on the uh, LMS and put that money out to a warrant article. We already have the equipment, is my understanding. All the material is there. We might have to pay a little extra a year or two down the road to finish that job, 
but I would rather keep the teachers than upgrade the kitchen at LMS. Move the refrigerator outside. <laughs> so, so um, okay, uh, great. Yeah, so I'm glad that you know you both mentioned um, uh, possible uh, the ramifications to to teachers and mm -hmm. staff and and so forth. Because certainly a um, move from the operating budget to a default budget would be, as you said, eighty percent is is human capital. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so that would be a um, most likely the case. There'd be a lot. There would be a lot of, of reduction in forces. Um, and you know, I've I've been in this district eighteen years, and I I can tell you that um, I've worked with some amazing people for many years at the high school, um, and now as president of the union, I've got to got to know amazing teachers at the at LMS and, and GMS and I can honestly say like teachers in this district it, it's too bad we have lost a lot of, of, mm -hmm. of teachers in the district over the past few years um, but there's there's so many teachers that are so dedicated here and just have not only do they you know spend um, a lot of their energies teaching and you know and that's all encompassing correcting and planning and stuff but they also build relationships with students. I think we do that particularly well mm -hmm. uh, in this district. Um, just talking with students, you know, they always see them and when um, uh, graduates come back and they visit, and, you know. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I hope um, the town gets to decide and I understand it's a, it's a complex issue, um, but I, I do hope that um, everyone, uh, every parent that has had a student come through here um, thinks about you know the human capital, like you said, Peter. Eighty percent of that. So there will be uh, there will be reductions in forces. Um, so, so just sorry, one thing about losing losing the teachers. So I think over the last three or four years, we've lost about eighty teachers, right, to either retirement, going to another district, getting out of education entirely. Um, you know, being a teacher is is a tough job. You know, um, everybody's demanding. You know, the taxpayers demanding. The uh, administration is demanding. <laughs> Parents are demanding. Um, so we really need don't to forget the students, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My students weren't that demanding. <laughs> my, by my students, I mean my kids. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there's there's something to be said. You know, why is that happening? You know, and that I think is probably one of our biggest problems as a district is why is that happening? Why aren't we able to replace these teachers? Right? There's a ton of jobs open. On the website, and I don't know that there's a huge pay disparity, um, but there's a culture problem somewhere, you know, and, and that needs to be fixed. And, and you know, I know they've done it recently. They did a teacher survey uh, maybe a month or two ago. I haven't seen any of those results. I don't know what the response rate was. I'm, I've heard historically it's pretty low, um, and I think that's in some measure because people are afraid they're going to be able to figure out who they are. Um, and they don't feel free to, to speak freely. My company, we do surveys every year, typically twice. Um, the last two years, we've been named the best places to work. It's done by a totally outside company. And all we get is a, a summary of the responses. Yeah. So we can't figure out who it was. They can do it at work. but it, um, And I think there's a fear, and, and a, some a teacher can tell me if I'm wrong, um, is that if you do it at school, they can say, okay, that was... That was Pat Keefe's computer. So you know, you know what he thinks that X, Y, Z is a bad idea, and that's wrong. So now we're going to, um, you know, unfortunately, um, and I didn't never experienced it, but you know, there's a certain level of fear of retribution if you speak up against the um, against the school board or the administration, and that's a problem. If you're not willing to listen to the people who are doing the work. You know, um, I wish this was my quote, but it's not my quote. Um, people don't <laughs> leave bad jobs, they leave bad leaders. And that's a problem. So we have work to do here, really, from the top down. Thank you, Peter. And Jeff, did you want to elaborate at all on that, too? Um, no, I'm good. That, I mean, that's well said. Um, you know, and it, it you know, I, I think that, that embracing the human capital aspect is just you know, one of the, one of the top things that we can really focus on. Great. Thank you. Um, last questions. And then I have just kind of a general one for you. Uh, a couple, couple more questions. You guys doing okay? Sure. Hold on there. Thank you. 
All right. Um, so, so in your opinion, what are, and, and again, you kind of talked about this, so you, you don't need to elaborate if you don't want to, um, but what are the, can you identify two strengths that you see in our schools? And can you think of two areas that you believe we can improve upon? And Peter, I'll start with you this time. Sure. I think the strengths in the children have always been the teachers. Um, and, and, the, and you mentioned it, a very dedicated group, um, very active in the community. Um, the the other thing is, I think the people that live in this town really want their kids to get the best that they can have. Um, and, and, and we have a very big volunteer contingent in Litchfield. You know, we don't have a big budget on the town side, on the school side. So to get stuff done, it takes volunteers, whether that be rec sports, yeah. um, other programs, music, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, if you look at the play, the three school play that happened this year, The Wizard of Oz, it was amazing how was amazing, yeah. that all three schools got involved in that and all the, uh, all the folks who were so deeply dedicated to that. Um, Amber Flint in particular, who sort of spearheaded the thing and uh, it was always interesting to drive by the pink house and see where, where they sort of were in getting to opening day, you know, opening night. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Litchfield is a unique town. Um, it's a great little town, and it, we have our problems we certainly need to address. But um, I think all in all, you know, there are people on both ends of the spectrum, not jobs on either side. Uh, but I think it's really a good, it's, we have a pretty positive group, you know. So people will do what we need. Great. And um, Peter, do you want to mention anything? I know you said that there, there's, you know, always some problems. But do you want to, any area that, specifically you believe we can improve upon and you might have touched upon it already and, but and I think the culture is a, uh, the culture is one of our biggest problems right so I think it, it it might be one two either way culture and and managing our money you know I think those are the two things that we really have to work on okay thank you Peter sure. and Jeff um, what are as two strengths uh, that you see in our school yeah, um, yeah I think you know, certainly touched on it on previously and you know I'm you know very very um, you know, similar in thinking to, to Peter, um, you know, it, the, the people, it's the teachers, um, those people who are, are, are making it work. Um, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the session took place at the, at the high school not too long ago, you know, at the end, the principal of, um, you know, GMS came up and, you know, we're making it work. We make it work. Um, you know, it, not everywhere do you have people who are so willing to, you know, make the sacrifices that are being made um, to make things work. So I think first and foremost that, you know, that that's in my mind, um, one of the top strengths. And then, and then, you know, um, you know, moving on to the community, how involved the community is, you know, it seems like, you know, whether, you know, I agree, you agree, anybody agrees with the other, um, it, it's very clear that there's a, a very large vested interest in, in the betterment and success of education in Litchfield. Um, and so it's about, you know, coming to terms with that, finding that middle ground to make it work and, you know, make it work well. Um, and then the second part of the question is... It, second part, yeah, Jeff, yeah. is there any um, specific areas that you think we can improve upon? Yeah, um, you know, I think, um, you know, based on based on what I've seen and, you know, read and observed, um, you know, you know, kind of, you know, similar to that, that idea of that, that culture, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that, that gets in the way of, a, of anything moving forward um, is communication. And, you know, from what I've seen and like watching some of these sessions, um, it, 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 there's a lot of like half of half of the story is being told. Um, you know, when watching, you know, watching the, the last session where, you know, the, the, all the Warren articles are being gone through, um, and, you know, the public was asking questions, um, you know, about the budget and, you know, things like that. Like, you know, I unfortunately wasn't able to attend, um, with COVID, but, you know, what, watching all of that, you know, it's like the questions were not answered. There was no direct answer. It was like, it's just smoke and mirrors. Um, you know, and I think like really in, to a, the biggest thing to address is that communication. How, how does the school board, how do we communicate in a clear and direct manner um, where there is no question about what it is that is going on? Um, you know, I think that would go a long way in, in building the public trust, um, which I think, you know, I can, it's like 
you know, the, the separate, the second kind of challenge is issues that trust the public has. I think that, you know, there's been, you know, whether you want to call it mismanagement or, you know, deception or, you know, whatever it could be, um, you know, I think that it's compounded into creating, you know, that lack of communication has now created a mistrust that is making it so it is very difficult to get things passed and move forward um, and everybody working together in unison. Very good. I've heard uh, from both of you this evening that uh, clear, uh, direct communication is really, in, really important um, uh, to having a successful uh, school district. All right. Thank you both for that answer. The next one is, um, so you both have talked about um, engaging the, the uh, community mm -hmm. and uh, collaborating with the community. How will you engage the community to improve the schools in Litchfield? So how will you go about doing that? Um, who did I start with last time? I think I started with Peter last time. So Jeff and then Peter. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, getting, getting some, some more dialogue going, um, you know, spending time out and about, um, you know, what, with neighbors, you know, coming to, um, you know, various events at, at down at town hall, helping to organize those types of events. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, being relatively new to Litchfield, Litchfield and moved here, you know, Valentine's Day last year, um, and just seeing the amount of activity that goes on within, you know, within this community with that, you know, how small it is, especially, um, you know, I'm originally from Southern California, grew up in a, in a city, 250,000 people. Um, and you're hard pressed to find anything operating on a level that it is here. Yes, there were things to do a lot of, a lot of things going on, but it was all driven for profit businesses, you know, putting on these big things, um, you know, and so really working to, you know, connect with the different groups that are active, um, you know, whether, you know, parent groups or I know there's the, you know, the holiday, um, you know, committee folks who put on, you know, the displays here at town, at the town center, um, the, the parade, you know, all of that good stuff. Um, you know, and then I think, you know, for me, you know, one of the things I, in my personal life, I've um, really stayed away from, you know, like social media. Um, it's just something for me on a personal level, um, you know, I've just never felt the need for. Um, but it's something, you know, I think it's it's the perfect platform to, you know, really, you know, be able to, you know, I, I want to make myself available. And, you know, here's a direct way to do it. Here's my email. Here, here's how you can track me down. Let's talk. You know, what's on your mind? Um, you know, just really, just, you know, staying, staying engaged and, you know, welcoming, open, candid conversation. I, lo I, I love social media as long as we're not making TikTok videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's all my students want to do these days. I don't yeah. see anything like it. <laughs> New Hampshire's attorney general is on it now, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah he know. is, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, no, we may not have TikTok in the United States for much longer. We'll yeah. see. Right. We'll it's see. A, yeah. It's a federal issue too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. And Peter, I asked you the same question. How will you engage? How will you engage the community to improve the schools in Litchfield? So, if I were, I guess, lucky enough to be uh, elected to the school board, I, you know, one of the things, and I've spoken to the school board a couple times, and it's not necessarily the most comfortable thing in the world. So you get up there and you ask a question, and you have a point, and they just look at you like. You know, there needs to be some conversation. I know they don't have to respond, but whoever's sitting in that chair, it took a lot of courage to sit there. Answer their question. If you don't have the answer, tell them you get back to them with an answer, or you're going to consider it. Whatever it is, don't just look at them. I've been there too many times, and it's like a bunch of dead fish. <laughs> like, they, you know, they don't want to respond. One, maybe, maybe the question's uncomfortable, not that I would ever ask anybody an uncomfortable question, um, but it's... It's, un it's really uncomfortable to go there. Um, you know, it's, the other is, I, you know, we do, people, we need to produce, when people write to the school board, right, they do a summary over there of, of what they got for correspondence for the, for the week or the two-week period. Yeah. Why can't we post that on the website, right? As, unless a parent didn't want it. If it was, you know, my, you know, Sally, my daughter is having this problem with so-and-so. That wouldn't go there. But general questions and then show that dialogue back and forth. What's the answer? And I think the school board also needs to communicate with the whole town. Right now, they just communicate to the parents. I don't know that there's a way that people like uh, Diane and I can get these notifications of what's going on at the school. I think it just goes out there. You know, that, that would be, I think, beneficial to help 
for lack of a better term, convince people who don't have kids like myself. And uh, I'm part of the reason I'm running for school board is because I don't have kids in the school. I have no agenda. I'm not trying to push a special program. I don't want there to be three baseball teams, um, although it would have been nice in my case here. <laughs> um, I think they just need to communicate with the whole town, not just with their customers, you know, because their customers are not the only ones paying the bill. Very good. Thank you both for the answer there. Um, so I guess last question um, I have for you is, or actually, is there anything that, that, um, that you guys actually, that I haven't asked um, that you would like to kind of just discuss about the school district? Anything that we didn't touch upon that you'd like to touch upon? Um, start with Peter this time, I think. Um. I think I would like to see it, and maybe this isn't an answer to your question, but I think I would like to see a more direct line of communication between the teachers and the school board. Right now, as I, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, everything has to go through the SAU, right? Or um, everybody needs to be in the room. And for lack of a better term, I might use the term whistleblower, right? Um, and again, back to fear for their job. and. And I think if you get labeled, the, the teaching community in the, in the state is not that big. So if you get labeled as a troublemaker at ABC school, it's going to be hard for you to get hired somewhere else. And it may not be that you were the problem. It could have been uh, another teacher. It could have been a parent. You know, it could have been anybody. Um, but there has to be that sort of, the teacher should be comfortable going to the school board without having their boss, whether it's the principal of the school or their supervisor or you know, a parent and a teacher, whoever, talk to the school board in confidence and not be worried about getting their, their feet taken out from underneath them. Okay, thank you, Peter. Jeff, anything that we haven't touched upon tonight that you'd like to touch upon? Um, no, I think we know. we've we gone through quite a bit. Uh, you know, I, I don't wanna talk myself in circles if I can help it, um, uh, you know, feeling, feeling good. Awesome. Well, um, I just want to uh, remind our viewers um, that uh, next Tuesday, Litchfield uh, residents go to the polls. They'll have some really important decisions to make. Um, but the most important decision is to go to the polls and vote. That's the most important uh, decision. And cast, uh, you know, your, with your conviction and... Um, and uh, for you gentlemen, uh, I want to just say, and I mean this sincerely, thank you both, not only for being here and participating in this dialogue, but for running for office. Because it takes a lot of guts to do that. And it, it, it takes a lot of uh, chutzpah. And uh, <laughs> it really does. So, so I, I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, teachers and uh, people in the community that really appreciate it. And, um, you know, as a school board member, you, you've seen that school board members have to uh, stand up and, um, and and answer questions from the community. And so I think it takes a lot of courage, number one, to, to run for office in the first place because you only have one winner, you know, and you're putting yourself out there. So thank you both for that. And two, for serving on the school board. The winner will serve on the school board. And, uh, and thank you for doing that because it takes a lot of guts and a lot of heart uh, as well as intelligence. So I want to thank you both. Well, thank you for having us, Pat, really. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Um, unless there's any questions from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> you asked all the questions. You stole mine. <laughs> all right, then we'll go ahead and, uh, and end the meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone, for that tunes in, for watching this. And again, thank you so much to uh, Jeff and Peter for participating in this event. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.